Hi everyone, welcome to our very first webinar, The Art of Microsphere Coding, uh, which will be about a 30 minute adventure into Microsphere Coding. Uh, to introduce ourselves, I'm, I'm Kathy Kilbride. Uh, I'm our technical service manager. Uh, with me is Sharmi Isaiah, our materials manager. Good afternoon. And she also has a, a wealth of experience, uh, direct experience in particle coding. And I also want to say a thank you to Amy Royal, who's our marketing guru, and uh, who helped us immeasurably with the, uh, pulling all of this off. Um, before we dive in, I just want to uh, note that we'll be able to take a few questions, and we will also post a follow-up Q&A on our website. So please feel free to take a, a look at that. So firstly, just thinking of our objectives with bead coding, uh, and, and taking a typical protein coating on a particle, uh, our aims are generally going to be good protein coverage, which we take to mean high specific binding and low non-specific binding. Um, so to achieve that, we of course coat particles uh, with a specific ligand of some sort, an antibody in this instance, and also we utilize a blocker to block bare patches on the surface of the micro microparticle and deter non-specific binding. Uh, so bees won't stick to each other and we don't have unintended things from samples sticking to particles. Also, uh, we're going to be talking about how to preserve characteristics of this uh, coated particle during its active shelf life, whatever that might mean for you. So additionally, we want to note that microspheres come in all shapes and sizes and so do coating protocols. So while we'll be going over a very uh, kind of a, a general coding strategy, uh, we just want to note that these same chemistries can be adapted to particles of different sizes, uh, made of different matrices, such as silica, magnetic particles, those sorts of things. Um, additionally, these same chemistries can be used for different types of ligands, uh, whether you're working with a peptide, DNA, glycoproteins, um, and also protocols can be further customized and optimized and, of course, scaled up if you're working in a commercial environment. So before we get started, it's appropriate to have the right tools for the task. Um, a calibrated pipette, a centrifuge or micro centrifuge, depending on your scale, a bath sonicator. This will aid in resuspension of microspheres and also and aiding with aggregation issues. Um, a rotator, which you'll use during incubation period as well as this can help with resuspension of microspheres. And uh, test tubes in various sizes, this will depend on your scale. Uh, vortexer, this will aid in uh, aggregation issues as well and resuspension. And the most important item in your lab is your microscope. You will use it to look at your beads throughout the coding process and see what's happening. Okay. Um, just looking at kind of a prototypic protocol, um, the coding components that we're going to be discussing are, of course, an antibody uh, or whatever your ligand might be. Uh, microspheres in this case, uh, we're going to be featuring carboxylated polymer spheres. And then also, uh, for today's purposes, we'll be using our polylink coupling kit protocol as an example. Um, but again, this is just a single example, and there are many different sorts of uh, protocols, reagents, and buffers out there. Uh, so to conduct a coding process, you'll need a cross-linker uh, to link the ligand to the particle. In this case, it's EDAC, which will activate the carboxyl groups on the particle. Uh, you'll probably want a blocking molecule of some sort. Um, we often use BSA, uh, but it's just one of many. You can certainly use things like casein, other sorts of proteins, albumins, uh, detergents, and also synthetic polymers, such as polyacrylic acid. Uh, and actually, we I'll just make note that we have a microsphere reagent development guide uh, that we can send to you or you can download from our website that has a, a, a nice list of blockers and their molecular weights. Um, also, you'll likely want a surfactant uh, to utilize. This might be tween tw something like tween 20 or Triton X100. Uh, 
Also in final storage buffers, we commonly include an antimicrobial agent. Sodium azide is very common or something like Proclin. And this particular kit also comes with buffers. We utilize a coupling buffer that's a meth buffer with an MES buffer pH 5.2 and also a wash storage buffer that's a TRIS buffer with BSA and Proclin. So that's our blocker and an antimicrobial. Also, buffers will usually have a couple of functions. So the coupling buffer in this case, we'll use it as a buffer to do our pre-washes. It's important to note that it's free of any additives like surfactants or proteins that might begin coating the particle and would compete with the ligand that you're purposefully putting on the surface. And then the wash and storage buffer actually in this case is it has some nice stabilizers. It also has our blocking molecule. When working with EDAC, it's important to check the appearance before use. It should appear light and fluffy. If you notice clumps that don't easily break apart by touch, the material has most likely been exposed to moisture and you should not use it. So that would be like with a small spatula or something, you could press on it and correct. It's okay. A good way to prevent exposure to moisture is store your EDAC in a desiccator. Here we have a typical glass desiccator with indicating desiccant in the bottom. Backing grease is used on the lid to form a tight seal. The indicating desiccant is sold separately but is very useful. The desiccant will absorb any moisture trapped in the desiccator. The desiccant will then turn a light pink color and then you will know when it is time to change. Now I can see just a little bit of pink in this image, but when typically would we know to change out the indicating desiccant? Just to be prudent, I would change the desiccant out when more than 50% of it is pinkish color. Also, EDAC will need to come to room temperature before use. It is recommended to do so in a desiccator as well. When you receive EDAC, it should come with a pillow desiccant. It's a good idea to keep this with your EDAC. So if you don't have a desiccator, you can place the EDAC and the pillow in a sealed bag and put it on the bench top and allow it to come to room temperature. So just like a standard baggie would suffice? Correct. Okay. Okay, so now that we've lectured you a little bit on proper care of your reagents, before we get started with the coating procedure, it's very important that you know you have a good quality suspension going into the coating. Because if you don't, if you have an aggregated suspension, things certainly aren't going to improve once you begin the coating process. So as a matter of course, we roll or rotate our suspensions for a couple of hours prior to sampling if it's from a bulk container and certainly prior to coating. And then also we inspect the suspension to ensure that it's monodispersed. And this would be where Sharmi had been talking about the importance of a microscope. And how typically would you inspect it? How would you prep a sample? Depending on the solids of the suspension, say you take a 10% suspension, you can dilute it with water to look at on the microscope so you won't have overlay of particles. You want to see individual particles and make sure there is no aggregation. Say 10 microliters to 20 microliters of water. Any kind of slight dilution is helpful. So really not a, just a really straightforward, place a little bit of a transfer pipette on the surface of the slide, cover slope and take a look. And I believe that this particular image and our kind of our standard magnification for viewing microspheres is going to be 400x, so like a 10x objective and 40x magnification. Now if you start the coating, or if you are first sampling from the bulk suspension and you find that the material is aggregated, you can 
you should use some sort of physical method in order to break up aggregates and return it to a monodispersed state. So typically we would sonicate it, vortex it, roll, rotate. Um, the idea being that sonication will kind of blast apart the aggregates and uh, rotation will you know, redistribute any surfactant or, or keep particles from clinging to one another. And then uh, again, you're going to inspect the suspension to ensure that it's uh, monodispersed. Um, I'll also mention that if you are opening a fresh bottle of particles and it looks like this and it's brand new, it may mean that it uh, froze in transit if, or froze in your receiving area or maybe a cold spot in a refrigerator. Um, once polymer micro microspheres in particular, but other sorts of microparticles, uh, once those suspensions freeze, it's nearly impossible to return uh, the suspension to a monodispersed state. So it's very important not you know, just to keep particles from situations where they could freeze. Um, now, if you've had a suspension that hasn't frozen, but you've had it in storage for quite a while, and you're seeing some aggregation, it's likely just that particles settled over time. You might have had some surfactant migrate out of uh, the suspension and kind of coat the walls of the bottle. And so it's just going to be kind of a transient, uh, uh, transitory excuse me, aggregation that you can easily treat with sonication or just a couple of hours of, of rolling. Um, so once you start the coating process, uh, we do always recommend that you pre-wash microparticles. In this case, we'd be doing it in coupling buffer, which again is going to be uh, free of any sort of blocker or stabilizer. Um, so we're trying to remove all of these additives to give our beads a clean surface. Uh, these pre-washes also serve to normalize the environment and really, you know, get the pH where it needs to be, prepare the particles for that first reaction or for the next reaction uh, in the coating process. Uh, so then you're going to uh, reconstitute EDAC, uh, immediately add it to the microparticle suspension, allow bead ac uh, activation to proceed for about 15 minutes, add antibody, and then incubate that for 30 to 50 minutes. And I'll just note that in this example, we're utilizing a one-step coupling procedure, which means that we're adding the EDAC, we're activating particles, and we don't wash out any surplus EDAC. We just give sufficient time for that reaction to fully occur. Then we add the antibody in, and that way we ensure that uh, cross-linking, uh, antibody, antibody cross-linking doesn't occur. But there are, again, all of these things are points of optimization, and you can certainly use two-step procedures. You can change incubation times temperatures, things of that sort. Um, during the coating process, uh, you may want to briefly bath sonicate the suspension to, you know, just as you're getting started to ensure that the, it, um, that the particles remain well dispersed. and then rotate the suspension, the suspension very gently and slow, slowly during the course of the protein incubation. And you can see this is kind of a usual rotator that we have. At, and sometimes aggregation will be observed during the course of the of the coating procedure or at the conclusion of the coating procedure even. I think it's more common probably during the coating procedure once you activate the particles you're kind of collapsing the charge on the surface and you're no longer benefiting from charge repulsion between the particles and so that is a very very common phenomenon. Correct. Um, I'd recommend sonicating your suspension at least one time during your incubation period, and depending on the length of time uh, you are incub incubating, but say an, if you're incubating for an hour, I sonicate uh, or vortex um, there halfway through. Now, what would your advice be for really tiny particles, say, you know, in the 100 to 500 nanometer range or even smaller, because I know especially for polymer beads, they're essentially hydrophobic particles. You have a lot of surface area there. And once you collapse charge on the surface, they're really going to be happy to cling to one another. 
Correct. The smaller the particle, the more difficult it is to work with. Um, so you can increase those uh, sonication times in, in the incubation period. Uh, say every 10 or 15 minutes, you can place it in a water bath for 10 seconds and then put it back on your end over end rotator. Okay. And so just a, a fun little cartoon of what we've just accomplished. So you begin with a carboxylated particle, activate with EDAC. Oh, they look very active. Put in our antibody or our amine containing ligand, in this case an antibody, and end up with a uh, perfectly coated bead, more or less. <laughs> uh, so is that all? Um, no, not at all. Um, to get a, just a, a kind of a quick uh, and easy protocol, yes, this sort of a process, sort of a kit, you'll definitely get protein on the surface of the particle. It should be active. You should have a nicely coated bead. Uh, however, if you have commercial aims in mind, you probably need very specific performance out of that microparticle reagent. Uh, so it's really, really important to conduct uh, microsphere optimization. Uh, this is going to include base bead screening at the start. Uh, this could be fine-tuning the diameter of the particle, uh, certainly considering different sorts of matrices, be it uh, polymer, silica, magnetic. Uh, you may be optimizing surface titer. Uh, you may find that a, you know, a lower surface titer, titer or mid-level surface titer is advantageous in some instances. Not always, but these are questions that you'll want to consider. Uh, antibody screening is very important. You certainly can never optimize out of a, a poor, uh, poorly performing antibody. So if you're getting a lot of nonspecific binding, but you didn't pre-screen your antibody, um, yes, it could be a case that, that your beads aren't sufficiently blocked or coated, but it could also be an instance where you simply have an antibody that's giving you a lot of cross-reactivity and nonspecific binding. Also, we recommend uh, conducting antibody titrations uh, as I mentioned briefly, uh, a fully coated bead isn't always the aim of a coating procedure. It may be that you want to, you know, have antibodies fully packed onto the surface of the particle, uh, but in some instances, this will lead to a lot of nonspecific binding. Uh, in other cases, it just wastes a lot of expensive antibody. And so you will want to um, really sort out how much antibody you want on this, or ligand you want on the surface of the particle. Um, also, uh, the blocking system is going to be very important. And, and by noting blocking system, uh, it's important to realize that there is, of course, blocker on the surface of the particle, whether we put, you know, as Charmy was discussing, VSA directly and intentionally on the surface of the bead and our intent is for it to stay there or uh, additionally, well, I should say, and additionally, there are uh, blocking molecules that are uh, in the storage buffer or certainly in reaction buffers once you get to the point of conducting a reaction. Um, and you may find that you need to reoptimize your blocking system by selecting a different type of blocker, a combination of blockers, uh, again, you can use a combination um, of proteins, uh, detergents, synthetic polymers. Uh, there are just all sorts of things. And they'll also yield different charges and different nonspecific binding um, characteristics. And is that all? No. Uh, it's very important that you evaluate coded particles. Uh, this is going to be while you are both while you're developing and fine tuning a coding process, uh, and also certainly at the end of one, once you've established a coding process and, and finalized it, every lot of beads that you manufacture, of course, you're going to have to find some way to evaluate it. Um, our TechNote 205 provides a lot of different uh, methods that you can use to do this. This includes everything from uh, an a, something simple like an A280. Uh, total protein assays, which you can do directly on the particle. This would be like a BCA assay or a Lowry assay. One thing that we really like um, to use if the particles are long enough would be something like a flow cytometric assay, uh, where your, uh, you take an anti-ligand antibody that's conjugated to fluorochrome and 
uh, run unstained and stained beads on the flow cytometer. And that's what these, these two histograms that are showing illustrate a particle that is unstained and then a particle that's fully stained because this is giving us a very nice graphical representation of not only high binding, you can see this dramatic shift in, in fluorescence intensity, but additionally, we have a very narrow peak at the rightmost end of, our, of this histogram, which illustrates a very uniform coating on the surface of the particles. So we find those sorts of assays to be very informative. Uh, it's also important to assess performance of the particle in the actual test or assay. And over time, you're going to need to assess, assess stability of the reagent. And at any point during this process, uh, you should be thinking about whether or not there's a need for reoptimization or you know, tweaking of different components, whether it's something like it, you know, looking for a microsphere with a slightly different surface titer, uh, whether you need to take another look at your blocking system, or of course, by the time you get to um, actually trying beads out and test or assay, are there assay parameters that need to be adjusted? And these might be things like incubation times, uh, dilution factors, uh, different blocking molecules or additives in uh, different sort of buffers. And so it's really, you need to think of it, I, I think is really a feedback loop and something that can be very dynamic. And hopefully you work through the, you know, the, the development process and get to a point where you have a very robust coding process. And then you're simply just, you know, confirming your good results at the end of that coding. And Charmy's smiling at me. <laughs> So just to recap, um, we view a lot of our published protocols, and again, this could be something like our PolyLink kit. Um, our, our product data sheet 644 has a nice one-step protocol in it, uh, and our TechNote 205 has a variety of good general protocols. These are really just starting points from which to optimize. Uh, you will want to look at a, a probably a variety of factors and, and really scrutinize what your system needs, what what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you certainly want to carefully select and screen com other components in the reaction. Uh, this is going to be the beads themselves. Uh, make sure you do your antibody screening in advance. Uh, design of experiment principles and software are very helpful for optimizing different components and parameters. Uh, we also advocate uh, very strongly using fresh reagents, and if you choose to store your reagents to take good care of them. Uh, for example, BDAC is, is a relatively cheap reagent, and using a fresh bottle each time you run an experiment would be recommended. But if you choose to store um, this item, take extra care in the storage and handling like we were talking about a desiccator and when you're bringing things to room temperature um, in order to preserve their shelf life. And really, it, and, uh, we're and we showed the two images, but uh, we're talking about a desiccator in the freezer and a separate desiccator on the bench top so that you can move that reagent from frozen storage directly to a room temp environment and have it protected the whole time. Um, also, it's important to maintain the quality of the suspension uh, once, well, before you've ever coated the particles, and then once you have coated them. Uh, this can be achieved through rolling and rotation. Uh, certainly don't freeze the suspensions. And once you've coated the particles, and, and of course in advance as well, you want to ensure that you're not contaminating them. Even if you include a microbial agent in your final storage buffer, it may not be a broad spectrum agent. It may not be a bios, uh, a biocide. It may be biostatic. Uh, so it's important to understand the capabilities as well and, and, and the, the spectrum of the biocide or the uh, antimicrobial agent that you're using. And then finally, the very important point is you cannot repeat this math, <laughs> how your, the microscope is your, should be your best friend. Um, but to have an effective coating, you need to know what's happening during the process. Uh, if you start out with aggregated particles and you didn't take the time to look, you're already headed down the wrong path from the beginning. And really, if you, developing a good eye on the microscope may take a little bit of time, 
But once you start looking at, you know, just taking a look at suspensions that you might have in storage through the coating process, you know, don't hesitate to take a small sample during the coating process so you understand if you're encountering ag aggregation, you can address it right then. Um, because if you, if you do encounter aggregation, even a low level of, or moderate level of aggregation, maybe your test or assay can tolerate that from a diameter standpoint but you're losing surface area and uh, by extension losing activity. So uh, do use a microscope, do develop um, what we used to call the bionic eye. And so now we will thank you for sticking with us during this 30 minute presentation. Um, since you have, we're gonna reward you with the secret of our coding processes, which is simply, it's a bit of work but we're confident that fame and fortune await. And I'm sure, how's it going, Sharon? <laughs> it's going great. It's going great, awesome. <laughs> we also wanna direct you to some resources that we have available. We do have a wealth on our website. Again, um, uh, product data sheet 644 is our polylink protocol. This is just a one-step EDAC uh, procedure for cloxylated beads. Our TechNote 205 covalent coupling has a lot of different sorts of chemi chemistries represented. It also addresses uh, different optimization points. It has a lot of buffer recipes. It also suggests different assay methods for QCing your particles uh, while you're developing a, a coding protocol and, and certainly um, QCing finished reagents. Uh, we also suggest taking a look at our microsphere reagent development guide. Uh, this covers things like bead selection for different sorts of tests and assays and also provides some lists of blockers. Uh, it also has a, a handy centrifugation chart that Charmy developed for us. And uh, one of our favorite books is uh, Bioconjugate Techniques uh, written by Greg Hermanson. This has just a, a vast array of different protocols, different chemistries. Uh, there are certainly many cro chemical cross-linkers in addition to EDAC that have uh, different spacing uh, abilities. You, you can certainly incorporate a hydrophobic linker, a hydrophilic linker. So if you need to get to the point where you, you really do need a designer chemistry, that is an invaluable uh, resource. We also want you to feel free to uh, submit any questions to us. You can do it through this webinar. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll be publishing a Q&A following the webinar. Uh, if you have anything you'd like to discuss with us directly, you can certainly give us a call or just uh, send us a, a direct and private email. We'll be very glad to have a conversation with you about your specific scenario. So thank you very much for spending this time with us. And do feel free to contact us 